for Grinder School doing a live uh, $3.45 hand history view with Jam Balance. We actually have her live. You want to go ahead and say hey? Hey. All right. She was uh, kind enough to do this live session with me at uh, a bit of a short notice. So it's not really anything I've done in terms of videos for you guys yet. So hopefully you will enjoy it. So Jam Balance, how long have you been playing these 45 mans? I started playing the 45 Mans back in August. August. And you'll say they're kind of going decent for you, or what? They were for a long time. Okay. All right, well, hopefully we could aim to plug okay. some leaks that you might have. you have anything else to say before we get started? I don't think so. All righty. Um, first off, do you recognize any players at these, this table right here? Um, this one, no. Okay. All right, so complete with Queen Jack, very good, and looks like it's a pretty easy check fold. So, and nine tenths offsuit. Um, let's say if it was limped around to you, let's say we have like a limper in middle position and a limper in the hijack, would you be limping nine tenths suited here? Me personally, I do not limp nine ten suited. Okay. I know other people do. Right. Uh, I mean, do you do you feel that your flop and post flop play is like okay, or is it very bad? Like, do you feel comfortable in those type of spots? I have decent post flop play. Okay. Probably not the best. All right. Well, I assume since like you're a winning player in these games, I don't think you need to have like a sufficient amount of skill as far as flop and post flop. So, I think if you would you know, feel comfortable mixing in some limps from a suited connected hands like 9-10 suited and 7-8 suited, things such as that. You're going to be getting like a high amount of implied odds from like this middle position limper and this hijack limper just because, you know, we're not expecting them to play well um, and most of these players at these stakes are going to play very poor poorly. So I'm assuming you as a thinking player would be able to handle those spots. So obviously it's not a huge deal. Things like 9-10 suited are usually just like a fold when we're playing quite a few tables, but... Um, if you can apply the focus to those particular spots, I feel it's a very plus EV situation, so... Yeah, I'm typically 20 tabling at least. Okay, alright. And, okay, that's kind of good that you say that, because one thing I do suggest uh, when I'm working with students to um, Im implement new things, whenever I discuss things with a student and I want them to apply them, it's typically a lot harder if that student sticks to that same amount of tables because we're, lear we're like we're learning new information and usually when we're playing 20 tables we have all these beeps and clicks going on so it's really hard to implement these new things so um, usually I advise like cranking down the number of tables for a little bit because there's a huge there's a huge discrepancy between playing to learn and playing to grind and Correct. at micro stakes sit and goes you know that's usually when we're trying to learn as much as possible you know so if we're able to implement these new things and increase our ROI by like a drastic amount when we're playing, you know, 12 tables, we're going to have a really big advantage if we just 12 table for like say 1000 games rather than 20 total for 1000 games. We might make slightly less in terms of an hourly rate, but our ROI is going to be higher and our game's going to improve and that's going to allow us to move to the $6 uh 45s a bit sooner. So there's just things that um I like to bring up. Obviously there's nothing wrong with 20 table if you do it well. But um, taking advantage of these extra spots is just going to be a lot more profitable. And when you work work on it, whenever you're playing a smaller amount of ta uh, a smaller amount of tables, it's going to be a lot e easier to do once you go back to your normal amount. It's going to feel more like a habit, you know. But unless you develop that, then it's not going to really follow through. Um, I agree. But yeah. So solid folds with the eights. Totally agree with that. What would you be doing with something like pocket tens or pocket jacks here in this spot? Jacks, I'd probably shove tens. It would depend on how I felt on the table, honestly. Tens, I'm probably leaning towards a fold as well. Okay, um, do you feel that you would set mine here with any sort of range? Because, like, if if we were to flat, we would be we would be you know pretty much turning it into set mining, right? Right. Um, if it were limped, I'd definitely set mine here. Okay. Um, now, one, I guess, it, it is going to be a little bit different in these three $3 games. I guess we could go ahead and look up uh, this player's information, Dino S8. I frequently do this in the middle of sessions. I got in pretty fast with it. Okay, so versus a player <laughs> versus a player like like this, usually sh shipping jacks for value is going to be fine because we can assume that they're 
pre-flop ISO range is going to be ra rather wide. But in this particular spot, the way I like to figure out what I like to do with jacks or tens is just really pull it up in, in stove and figure out what we do, how our hand fares versus their range in this particular spot. So if, if we have a player who decides to ISO something like, you know, 12%, well, with, without even having to plot looking in, we automatically know tens and jacks are well ahead of um, their ISO range. So we could be mm -hmm. shoving for value if, if we feel that's that sort of player. Now, if it's a little bit closer and let's say they're ISOing 7%, which is a fairly tight range, um, shipping a hand like jacks, it's usually going to force them to play perfect versus our range, which means like the reason why they're ISOing is they're trying to get value from these limit limpers, but whenever we shove versus an ISO, they're going to fold all the hands that we beat and typically call with all the hands that beat us, beat you know, us. except for the, the exception of ace, ace, king primarily. Um, so it's just really something you have to uh, observe in the uh, general dynamic of these games. You know, are players stacking up with ace jack and ace queen? And I mean, do they? Yeah. Yeah. So, so like typically, if that's going to be their calling range versus like a shove, then uh, you know, sho shoving something like jacks so would be fine. And also, since you do have a high amount of implied odds, sometimes flatting there with tens is going to be pretty decent actually. So just some things to keep in mind. So far, everything looks good. Solid fold with the ace deuce. Do you have any questions so far? No. Okay, cool. Okay, what would you say your typical sho shoving range is right, right here? Without antes, it's probably. Queen nine's probably at the bottom of my shove range. If okay. I shove this, okay, um, I prefer suited. Right, of course. Yeah. Have you played live before? Yeah, I play live. Of course. And then you have a HUD, right? I yes, don't sir. run my HUD when I'm playing forty fives. Okay. But I have one. Okay, but you have one. Is there any specific reason that you don't use it? Like, do you have poker track and it doesn't work as well with multiple tables, or what's the? My reason? laptop sucks. <laughs> That's a pretty good reason I used to be in that same boat myself. Um, but I guess for those who do have HUDs, and let's say you're only playing a few amount of ta tables at this point, all you you know you did say you played 20. Um, I sort of feel like with 12, you know, we almost should be able to keep track of you know what's ha happened at the table, especially with a HUD. So for those who do you know use a HUD, we should always consider how our opponents perceive us. Um, so in your experience playing live. Let's say you're playing a turn tournament and you folded for the last, you know, I mean, let's say you folded for the last 25 hands, which is pretty much like 45 minutes worth of play, and then you're down to 10 big blinds and they see you shove. Um, the reaction is pretty much like, holy crap, this person's shoving 10 big blinds. You know, I'm gonna fold. They're crazy, right? Yep. Yeah. And so we should pretty much assume that the majority of these players, you know, given that they're unknowns, they're probably one tabling donks. You know. And the fact that they're, you know, just one tabling and they're not that, you know, deep thinking players, they're probably going to assume that with a fairly tight, or not a fairly tight range, because they don't really think of range, they just think, okay, this player's been tight, so they probably have a good hand, or this player's been loose, they loose, they probably have a bad, bad hand. So if we have a HUD and we're able to see that we've played like a zero over zero over 25 hands, they're probably going to perceive our range is very, very tight here. You know, we're, mm -hmm. for a way of a strong hand. So I feel in this particular spot, we could actually shove, you know, quite a bit wider than queen nine, especially because we're in chip EV. Whereas, let's say we've shoved the past three hands in, in a row, I'd be a whole lot less inclined to be sho sho shoving hands like, you know, queen, queen five, because we've lost our fold equity because we, we've shoved so many times. Um, so I feel in this spot where we haven't really shoved at all, we could actually up our range to be shoving like around 75%. Um, yeah, I think that, that's what I shove when there's antes. Good, good. Yeah, so I mean, um, so far, you know, your range sounds fairly well, but I think if, if you can at some point take some of these things into consideration and, you know, consider your own image, um, I think that would help out quite a bit. Yeah. Obviously, pretty standard. 450 looks fine. Okay. Um, the King Queen. I sort of feel that, well, first off, before I give my thoughts about this hand, what do you think is your normal opening range right here? I tend, I don't know. I, 
I'm actually shocked I didn't open that. Okay, yeah, that's fine. I mean, yeah, you could just say, oh, there's a misclick I always open here. You know, that's fine. Um, yeah, so I definitely do feel that this spot is um, a solid a solid place for an open. Um, a few reasons are that Nick Fadden here in the cutoff, he's going to be coming along with a pretty wide range of hands that um, it's King Queen's going to play very well versus his range. And we also treat this that we're almost effectively opening from the cutoff, which is another good right. reason that we could open. And um, so yeah, King Queen's pretty strong hand. Definitely like to open it here, and I guess you agree with me. So not a whole lot there. Good. Okay, what do you feel that your range tip t uh, typically is in this spot? Um, with a gun, I have five big blinds. Mm -hmm. Um, any suited king. Okay. Most suited queens. Right. Um, probably. Probably queen ten off. Okay. Um, king eight off. All the pairs. Okay. Um, okay, so you mentioned you've done a, a decent amount of work with ICM, correct? Like with Sit and Get Whiz, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is fine if you say no or yes, but can you tell me some sit situations in which we might want to take a slightly negative E, uh, slightly net negative EV shove? Yes or no? No, I can't. Okay. I can't think of anything um, at the moment. Okay, so some of the limit limitations of I ICM are that it doesn't really factor how much equity or full of equity we lose whenever the blinds go through through us. And right. personally, like I think once the blinds go through us, when we have around you know five to six big blinds, our full equity goes down substantially because whenever we shove, our opponents are getting offered like one point seven or two to one, in which they could call very very wide. So, I'm very likely to be shoving um, a very, very wide range with five big blinds whenever um, we're short-handed, and I feel that we have a lot of fold equity. And going back to what I was saying about how we should consider our range, you know, we haven't played, an, you know, an insane amount of hands. You know, we've played three hands this entire set and go, so any player who's paying attention are, is going to perceive us as relatively tight. So I'm not saying I, I would shove queen five here. I think I would definitely shove queen five with two thousand chips, because um, you know the, the, the blinds are going to absolutely demolish us whenever they they go through us. But one thing that we should consider is when the blinds go when when, when they do go through us, we're going to be shoving into a one point eight k stack blind versus blind if it gets um, blind versus blind versus under the gun plus one and we're in the small blind. Or let's say the big blind gets to the bar person on the button right right now. We're going to be shoving into like a 1K stack after they post the blind. And in that particular spot, we're not going to have any fold equity at all. And the most important thing to maintain in these turbo sit and goes is our sense of fold equity so we can have a stack to abuse people around the ball bubble. Uh, it's a pretty vital spot. So um, I definitely would say I probably shove here more often than not. Um, seeing a fold's not bad. Um, the range that you mentioned pre previously, it's might be a little bit tight. Because uh, one of the reasons why these uh, these small stakes ones are so profitable is that you know people or unknowns in general they, they they still fold too much you know we're still able to keep our sense of fold equity and take advantage of the fact that they fold too much so queen five it's pretty close here if I had two thousand ships I most definitely would shove um, as far as your overall range goes I would say you should be shoving. Um, seven eight off eight nine suited queen seven off. Um, queen six suited, any suited king sounds good, king five off, um, any ace, any pair, things like that. So I think um, you probably could overall widen your range just a little bit. Okay. Pretty easy snap call. And, okay, so when did you play the sit and go? I think last week. Okay. And actually, I, I correct myself. I see this is a six dollar forty-five, and I think I, I said it was a three. 
Um, but anyway, so what sort of range are we likely to see from this player in the cutoff right here? Like whenever they limp. The limper? Yeah. Oh, jeez. Pretty wide range. With that, with that side stack, yeah. It's, right. It's I a wide range. Totally agree. So whenever this player shoves, and let's keep in mind they lost the last hand, so they're probably likely to be on you know, a relative form of tilt, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So given that we think this player in the cutoff is relatively loose, and that just adds dead money to the pot, and this player you know, could be on tilt, um, we are still fairly bit away from the money, and if we look at our top right, we see that we're getting two to one about. So what sort of range do we think the button is going to shove in the spot? Maybe something like, let's go and throw out some ranges there. Do we think they're going to shove as wide as like any suited ace? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm definitely just throwing out some ranges out there. Um, personally, I think they're probably pretty apt to shove any pocket pair, a lot of suited aces. Maybe not 10-9 suited. Um, oh, they'll shove the connectors before they show the... Shove okay, the, okay, good. Yeah. Good. Okay, so I should definitely keep in like queen, 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 nine suited and 10-9 suited and things like that. Definitely the 10-9, yeah. Okay, cool. Ten, yeah. Um, what about their off, off suit aces? Are, are they shoving ace-5 and below or what? This is a 6. Yeah, it's a 6. You said it was a $6. Mm -hmm. It happens. Okay. Not as regularly as in the 3s. Okay, cool. The 3, you could go all the way down to Ace 2. Okay. All right, so <laughs> we'll just like blend it a little bit. We'll throw an Ace 5 offsuit, and I think that'll be fine. So, off the top of your head, what percent equity do you think we're going to have versus 20% right here with, uh, with a hand like Ace 10 off? I'm not good with equity. Okay, that's fine. All right, um, I'm pretty sure we're going to have somewhere around 57 or 58 percent here. Okay, 57 percent, 56, 55, 54, 55 percent. 55. Yeah, 55. So whenever we're getting two to one, you know, obviously we only need 33 percent equity for it to be break even. So given that we're ahead of their range, um, this is going to be a great spot to ice, ice, uh, it's going to be a great spot to isolation shove. Um, okay. you know, we're already ahead of the range, plus we have a lot of dead money to make up for this, and, you know, um, I think if anything, their range is going to be a bit wider in this spot because, uh, they're likely to be on tilt, so I think this is a really good spot to iso shove, and I might even do it with things like, you know, ace eight off, you know, might be the lowest ace that I iso shove with. Um, definitely ace eight suited. I'll be iso shoving with things like pocket fives. Um, I think king jack, maybe king nine suited would be good here. Um, okay. They show up with ace nine, so would have dominated them. <laughs> but anyways, definitely a good spot to go over and throw into the mix. And I find a lot of spots like that they're pretty easy to to miss whenever we're playing a lot of tables. So that might be one of the things to keep in mind. That's actually one of my Weakest spots okay. is calling Great. ranges. Okay, um, do you have any more questions about that spot then, before we move on? No, I, you explained okay. it well, thank you. Okay, sweet. Um, Alright, obviously really good iso shove. Randy Ace Queen. Okay, shove right here. Now, I guess there's really no need to get too fancy in this spot. I guess the only thing I have to say about this is... The faster we ISO shove or the faster we, we call, um, it's more of a timing tell even to um, bad players. I think sometimes if, if we wait, we, uh, we make them level themselves into like maybe making like a thin, thin call. So I would say sometimes it's really hard to not like see kings and just put like snap call on because we want to get on to the next spot. But I think we're going to induce a lot of weaker hands to call if we just give it a little ex extra time. And also, as far as um, uh, having a bunch of unknowns in, in the blinds go, sometimes if, if we just flat, flat here, they might make a mistake as far as pot odds go and not consider our stack, and they might be even a little bit more inclined to call a weaker hand. Now, on the flip side, if, if we do have regs in the blind, they might perceive our flat as very, very strong, so it's definitely person-dependent, and it's very important to know who's going to you know, perceive our, our just call as weak or strong. But there's definitely some things that you could play around with a little bit. 
So, nice hands. We did add a reg to the table. King okay. James 94 is a reg. Okay. Okay, so... we switched. Right. Table. Right. So he, so he started right. So we're pretty much, like, in, in this particular spot, we're just going to consider the blinds. But definitely with a, with a reg at the table, we should be making those considerations. Nice hand. He's giving you a walk, which is sort of surprising. Yeah. Good fold. Good. Okay, so it looks like we are coming up on the final table bubble. Great shove. Looks like you have a pretty good sense of abusing the bubble a little bit. Um, okay, so now we're at the final table. We have 11k stack, 17k stack, and 9k stack to our left. Um, anybody else that you recognize besides King James 94? Luck flu. Okay, luck flu. And are they a good reg, bad reg? What's your reads? Um, they're $6 regs, so I don't play with them a whole lot. King James, from what I remember, he's a little bit nitty. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so obviously with these, uh, the Poker Stars 45 mans, top set, so I'm going to get paid, so it's a little more of a gradual payout structure than that of full tilt for those who like to play over there. Um, whenever we see Luck Flu make a raise like this, looks like he's trying to get value right here, so we probably have to expect him to show up with a pretty decent hand. He's queen. And digging the ISO shove, nice hand. So... And we have one, two, three, four, five. We have seven people left, and we do have some shorter stacks to our right. So this is actually a pretty decent spot that we could incorporate some abuse because, yes, there is a final table bubble and there's a direct money bubble, but there's also um, invisible in the money bubbles that we can take into consideration in this spot. So, um... Luck flu. Do you think he's more likely to be tight or 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 loose? You know, overall. Like, do you do you think he knows who who you are for for the most part? Like, has he played with him no. too much? Okay. So obviously, versus players who haven't played against, like a reg is always going to assume someone who shoves that they that they're shoving a pretty tight tight range. And they're going to give us like a lot of credit. So let me bring up Wiz here quickly, and we should be able to find some pretty decent spots. Let's see, it looks like, what hand is this, 67? All right, looks like this is the wrong file, let's see. No, I think the other two I gave you were 325s. Hmm. But there's the queen Okay, three, okay, so all right, this, this, I, this one's a $3 one, and then the other one's a $6 one. Okay, so slight deviation, a little, a little, a little bit confusing. Um, okay, so can you tell me something about like the min edge right 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 here by any chance? Like what does this edge mean? You want the I know that you want a higher number for the edge. The higher the number the better. Okay. <laughs> yeah, idea. no, okay, good. And this really isn't something I've figured out really till recently myself. I I've been digging into it a bit more. Um but, okay, so what this edge is in something like a $3.45 where as a thinking good player, tag player, um, we're going to want a higher edge because there's so many mistakes that are being made. Um, for example, you know, we, we don't want to be taking these really thin flips early on because we're going to be able to find a lot of good good spots because villains are making so many mistakes. Whereas, let's say we had a tay tay table full of regs. Um, we're going to want to take a very thin edge because there's not a lot of edge to be had at that particular table. This kind of ties along to the concept that we might want to take a negative EV spot for future situations just because it's so hard to find an edge. Um, but seeing our stack that we have 12 big blinds, looks like we're in a comfortable second slash third place right here. Um, we can maintain, you know, like a .12 edge. I think it's fine. Typically, um, I do like to st like study my own games like on a point zero zero one, just so I could know the thinnest amount of edge that I could extract if need be. Um, so I definitely think it's something we should play around with a little bit. Um, if we to to a point zero six, it definitely turns into a shove. Um, but at the same regards, uh, the most important thing about sit and go is that sometimes players dismiss is not playing with these ranges right here. 
So I assume we could probably keep it a point one edge and it's still probably gonna be a call, I mean a shove, because I don't expect this expect this player who hasn't played with us that much to be calling um, a hand like fours. Um, does that sound like a decent assessment from players in these games? Or at least raise? Um, I would expect them to call with most pairs. Most I pairs. Would, I would say they'd stack off with fours. I don't think they're stacking off any wider than that, though. Okay. What about hands like their weaker They might races? end king-queen, but... Why not king-queen? Okay. But you can't do that on whiz well, so I'd leave it at 12. Right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely important because if, let's say, this player calls, you know, 15%, this is definitely going to turn this into, like, it's going to make our range a lot more tighter. On the flip side, let's, you know, make them, you know, call 10, 10%, then their range is going to be a lot, um, our range is going to get wider the tighter they call because, you know, we're taking down a non-showdown pot a lot of the times. So on this flip side where, let's say we have decent amount of respect for this player, Luck Flu, um, let's say they have a hand like fours or fives, um, and John Blance likes to push in this particular spot. So, since they don't have a lot of history with us, and that they're going to assume that we're serving a relatively tight range, um, I think Wiz is probably going to put us on something like you know a third or thirty percent, um, and let's put it a little bit higher. Let's put it at four or forty percent, and we could even put it at something like one hundred percent. So, depending on what type of rate you have, um, just because of the ICM considerations, even if we're shoving 100%, it's very improper for them to be calling with a hand like fives, which is why it's maybe sort of a pri uh, surprise and you saying that they call up with a lot of pairs. Maybe that's why. It's a 325. Right. They, they are not ICM aware. For sure. Um, for sure. They stake off with, they call with queen 10. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, that, that's, that, that's definitely good to know. But, I mean... If 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 they are a reg, I think they'll generally stick to a tighter call, calling range because they know that's proper. Yeah. But if 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 they are an unknown, then they'll have a relatively wide calling range because they just really really they really, they really don't care. So I think this is a good spot to analyze and play around with the ranges a little bit and see what we're capable of shoving um, against what they're capable of calling and vice versa. So overall, it is a pretty pretty good spot to uh, go over. Um, but that being said, folding here obviously isn't bad. Um, it's probably a shove that you want to be making a six dollar. Um, okay, they're definitely probably a pretty bad rig if they're limping right here. Um, but in a three, um, passing up is fine. Now, um, something else really cool about Wiz that some people don't use a lot is um, we scroll down here and we see uh, this hero fold range. Let's put ourselves back on the hero. Actually, that's pretty important. We had king three. So we have king three off. Yeah. Now, let's go to the hero fold, fold range. Um, most players, since it is proper to shove in this particular spot, it is proper to shove around like 90% blind versus blind if if folded to in, in luck flu spot. So let's go ahead and see what it does to our range in this particular spot. So right now it's saying we're 76.8, but if, if we know luck flu is a really tight, aggressive player, they're going to be super likely to shove, let's say, at least 80, uh, at least 80%. So again, let's take a peek at our range, 76.8. Well, it's widen their range to 75% if and I guess it differs just a little bit. And if this player is calling properly wide, they'll be calling like 35%. And you can see how much that drastically changes our range, going from like a 60 point something to a 28, almost cut, cuts it in half, where if this player is going to shove wide and this player is going to call wide. Um, just because there's so much value in letting our equity increase by having people just, you know, go at, go at it with each other. Um, we have this bias against confrontation in sit and goes where if people knock each other out, we can just watch our equity increase. So that's um, typically a pretty cool feature in uh, sit and go was to um, mess around with. Anyways, deuce three, pretty standard fold. A shock, good shove. Good shove. Loose call. <laughs> Told you. <ya. laughs> yep, you're right. Good shove, 9-10. Solid, good, good. Yeah, okay, I like it. Um, like you said, I think um, some things that we might see in these three dollar forty fives is when players limp. Sometimes they really they might limp call a hand that it affects their equity in a negative way, but it really affects our equity in a negative way as well. Like. It's pretty bad for us if they limp call king queen right here just because we're having to go to showdown and risk busting out before this person. So 
in this particular stake, I, uh, I, I do agree with the limp in saying that sometimes people just limp call absolute trash. Am I correct in that assumption? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I do agree with the limp. Looks like we're just trying to team up and knock this player out. And, um, and now in this particular spot, uh, I might check here in hopes that um, the player in the big blind might shove their chips in. Because sometimes if yeah, I'm if, shocked I didn't. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So it's it's another you know uh, like another small error, but it's it's kind of good that we see these errors. Like, how often do you say you review your own hand histories? Uh, through SNG, I do SNG, but I don't actually go through the hand like this. Okay, yeah, this is this is really good because um, personally, like almost before or after every single session of sit and goes that I play, um, I'll typically re review um, hand histories. And it helps so much because, e like, e even you right now, like, you're able to say, like, wow, this is, you know, uh, incorrect play. And that's something you, you can note where you don't even need a coach to tell, tell you that's, you know, it's an incorrect play. It's just one of your own multi-tabling errors that you typically see yourself make. So this is good, and I definitely encourage you to, uh, to look at your games as much as possible because you'll, you'll notice 10 tendencies um, that you might not if you don't, if you don't review. Um, for, for instance, one of my leaks used to be, I would actually not play my mid aces at shorthanded tables in 18 mans, and I recognize that just by going through hand history after hand history, and I'd write that down on notepad, and I'd make sure I see that before every single session. And the more you have that on the forefront of your mind, the more you'll see um, those spots creep out of your game. Um, but yeah, obviously um, nothing wrong with doing this right here, but typically it might be better to just um, get value from a bluff. Okay, um, now... Can you tell me anything about like exploitive play versus unexploitive play? No. Okay. Um, un unexploitable play, it's always going to be profitable, and that that usually relies on the other person ma ma making a mistake. Um, so it's always going to be profitable, but it might not be optimal. And by optimal, I mean that's going to be, you know, the best play if we're like thinking on like a higher level. I guess the best way to put it is, let's say we're in like a pretty heated match of rock, paper, scissor, okay? And let's say this player does, um, he does rocks too many times, you know? So like our unexploitable play, it's just going to be doing rock, paper, scissors over and over again because the fact that he's overplaying one of those things, uh, we're going to be able to, you know, exploit that, I guess, just by playing our standard play. But if we really wanted to exploit it, we'd you know figure out the times he is doing rocks, and we'll do paper, I guess. Um, <laughs> kind of a weird ex explanation. But so in this particular spot, um, I think villain is limping a fairly wide range. But um, king queen suited, it's just so good to play a flop with. It's really e easy to navigate. Has good top pair value in a limped pot because we could assume that this player is going to be raising a decent amount of aces. Um, right, right here. So it's a it's, it's a pretty good pretty good hand to navigate a flop with, and I'd be a lot more apt to be shoving hands that have a good high card showdown value, but not good flop and post flop playability. And hands like that would be things like king five offsuit and ace deuce and things like that. So while I do agree with the shove, I think it's fine. I think it's profitable. We're gonna make money with that in the long run. Um, I think it is more typical of a player playing twenty tables. Um, but I think if we just give this spot a little extra attention it needs and, you know, maybe play a flop with this guy, um, I think um, we'll frustrate him a little bit more and more, too, when we play him, when we outplay him on flops, things like that. He did end up calling King-5, which, you know, as we are just saying, players like to limp call and say in hands, and there you have it. But um, I do think a shove, shove is fine, but I think the more prudent and profitable play is to check pre-flop. Good call. Okay. Um, are you familiar with um, Are you familiar with uh, Sage system heads up system is all? No. Okay. Um, that is a heads up system that's pretty much done by math. That um, I think I think Christopher Ferguson maybe had something to do with it. You know, he's one of those math guys. But um, so something like nine nine eight offsuit. No matter how wide. Well, I guess this guy's not going to call us like a hundred percent. But granted, like he is gonna be playing fairly wide, but I'm gonna assume even versus a, a wide range. What's going on here? So heads up, we actually need to have our min edge a lot smaller, um, and he's not gonna be calling us 16%. Well, let's see. Let's just go ahead and see what he has to be calling us with. Um, right here with the edge at 0 0.05. 
It looks like he has to be calling us, what is that, 40 something percent to make it an improf uh, improbable shove, unprofitable shove. So 30%, yeah, so, um, you know, go ahead and pull up the hand. Let's take a look at this again. With like a 0.5 edge, if he's calling like 37%, it's gonna be break even. Anything higher than that, it's gonna be bad. But, you know, just pulling this up right here, putting him on a range, um, you know, let's maybe plug in 40% and see what it is going going to be. You know, if we think this player is going to call us with king three, queen nine, jack eight, queen five, then yeah, it might be a, a reasonable fold. But I think something like 30% even though he did let them call us, it's going to be a little more characteristic of his range. So I would say push here. And also, Wiz might be freaking out just a little bit because it, it doesn't respond well when we have slightly over, over 10 10 blinds. I assume if we, if Villain had slightly under 10 blinds, it's going to change the range quite a bit. Um, good. A4, I think a fall is fine. A9, good. 7 4, it's fine. I call as well. Good. Yeah, really only that one mistake, in my opinion, as far as the heads of play goes. Quads is always nice. Um, so, overall, pretty good. Um, before I do a recap, do you have any questions about anything we went over? I don't think so. Okay. Um, I would say as far as general improvement, maybe just, you know, maybe for half of your sessions, try playing um, maybe slightly less ta tables maybe for some of your sessions play 12 tables and then you know work on some of those things such such as call calling ranges reducing misclicks um you know things like that and maybe just trying to pay attention to your overall Im Im image a bit more maybe finding spots to abuse those invisible bubbles like we saw with that king king three tie up hand um but other than that um fairly solid play and i could definitely see you moving up with uh with a little bit of work um so again um do you have anything else Nope. All right. So thanks for watching, guys. Um, I'll be doing more live hand history uh, review videos like this. So if you guys are interested, uh, be sure to hit me up on the forums or on Skype. And until then, this is Reasons 14. Later.